Healthcare is not a sexy industry for consumers. In fact, it's quite the opposite. So how can healthcare brands and businesses leverage the digital communications revolution to scale and to thrive? Today's guest, Outcomes Rocket CEO and founder Saul Marquez, says the answer is storytelling. What does that really mean? And can it be effective? Hi, everyone. I'm David Williams, president of strategy consulting firm Health Business Group and host of the Health Biz Podcast, a weekly show where I interview top healthcare leaders about their lives and careers. If you like this show, please subscribe and leave a review. Saul, welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. David, thanks so much for having me. Excited for you know, our uh, time together today. I, I'm nervous because you're the you know you're the you're the real podcast guy. So <laughs> we'll just uh, we'll we'll just see how it goes, and I'll try to uh, not have the sweaty palms, but. You do. You you're, you're 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 fantastic. I, I loved having you on the podcast back in 2019, I think it was, and uh, I've I've always been inspired by your work, and so glad to be here with you. Sounds good. Well, you know, you're. I could say in some ways you're like a you're like a born podcaster and storyteller, but I don't think you were literally born doing that. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your background, your upbringing. You know, what what was your childhood like, and what sort of influences have stuck with you throughout your career. No, thank you, David. Appreciate that. And and listeners, thanks for for spending time with us uh, this afternoon. You know, um, my mom and dad came to the states from from Mexico. We we lived in the basement of my grandparents' house for a long time, and I was one of the first in my family to to get into college. And you know, along the way, I was inspired by my mom. You know, her fierce optimism and just constant support. My uncle Leon showing me the hardworking ethic. You know, I, I had a, a, he got me a job early on, you know, cleaning toilets and and windows. And and he always told me, Saul, this is so you can see, you can do more. I, I want you to, to to do this because you could do more. Uh, but also, I want to I want to share about Julie Smith, a family friend who always helped me see beyond the bubble. That I, that I lived in, she would always find a way to inspire me. And I, I'm sure everybody listening, David, you too, could, could think about that person in your life that inspired you. One day she brought me a magazine. And in the magazine, there was a CEO of McDonald's. And I was floored, David, like that, that, that I found out he was of Mexican descent. And it opened up my universe. The possibilities opened. And I saw that there was a lot that I could do uh, in the world beyond sort of where I grew up in. And so, you know, I, I've been inspired by a lot of people um, and, and, uh, and I'm excited to, to continue that, it, be able to pay that forward for, for people either listening today or, or, you know, the people on my team at, at, at Outcomes Rocket. So a little bit about uh, me there. No, oh, that's great. You know, I was, I think it leads a little bit into my next question about your education. A lot of times I ask people, you know, what they studied, it's usually like engineering or science or, you know, some, or, you know, something business and, and especially like a story like that, like an immigrant story, a, a lot of times sort of one of the first in, to go to college in the family, it's got to be something like pragmatic, right? And, but I saw, and I'm not saying it was not <laughs> pragmatic, but I saw your, your, your studies, not, not, not just humanities, but classical humanities like it's, it's like it's almost it's almost another way of saying like this is not the degree you get if you want to get a job uh, it's, yes and and I, i'll tell you my mom and dad thought i was crazy um they're like what are you doing well then i i, I really like i felt the pressure so uh, there was this summer where i took an internship and it was commission only. And she's like, what is this kid doing? Like, like one thing, like, like history, now he's commission only. And I remember three weeks into the job, I came home and I showed her my paycheck. Yeah. It was $8,000 right. after three weeks of work. Yeah. And I saw in her face, maybe, maybe he knows what he's doing. Uh, yeah. And maybe he has an idea here. So I've always been, um, so as you mentioned, right, I, I, my undergrad is a Miami of Ohio communications major. I started as a communications major. I was so bored. Um, and, and uh, you know, I've always been a speech and debate geek. So I've always been into program oral interpretation, debate, just a, a passion for, for communication. I, I took a summer trip with a friend to Europe. And I remember being at the Acropolis, yeah. the, the, the foundation for Western civilization. I couldn't read a, a lick of Greek. 
And I, and when I came back, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to take a, a Greek class. And that was, that was it. Like I got hooked. I found Cicero, I found Aristotle and all of the elements of persuasion and communication within the books, the classics was really kind of what got me hooked and, and drove that. And, you know, springboarded into a, a career of sales and marketing from yeah. That. Well, it's good, you know, that you didn't give your mother a heart attack when you said, like, not only did you go to school on a useless subject, but then you you took a job where the salary was zero. So oh it's good gosh. that you uh, that you converted that into some commission sooner rather than later. <laughs> Amen to that. Amen to that. All right. So I saw, so Stryker, that's, that looks like one of the, I don't know if that was where you had the internship, but like that was a place I think you were, you were in sales and marketing there. What was, what was that about? Yeah. So my early career, you know, I wanted to get into med device, uh, striker communications, which is the, the lights and the different, different things, uh, in the OR they recruited heavily for Miami of Ohio. They didn't want to hire a classical humanities, yeah. uh, <laughs> like a history major. So, um, after a year and a half of, of putting in some sweat and, uh, and getting results at, at Cintas as a, uh, the uniform people, um, Stryker took a look at me and got started there. I was a sales rep there th through my time and Nuvasiv got, got to dabble in sales and marketing. Um, and so, you know, the foundational elements of med device is really kind of where I grew up uh, in the med device space. I always had this feeling though, like there's so much more than just med tech. Like you're, we're talking a $4 trillion yeah. you know, vertical here. And so I, I started dabbling into, into podcasting as a way for me to, as I tell my wife, the best club I ever joined to learn from some of the most interesting minds in healthcare. And you, you included, David, you know, I, I, you, I had a chance to interview you early on. So yeah, you know, that's where I started. And uh, to this day at Outcomes Rocket, we continue to be strictly focused on healthcare in, in the work that we do. That sounds pretty cool. Well, you know, I could see the need for you know, branding, uh, even with uh, like Stryker and Nuvasive, even those are like bad names of companies. A Stryker <laughs> is one thing. It sounds like you're going to get whacked with something. And then, you know, Nuvasive, people always talk about, you know, invasive and maybe non-invasive, but it's sort of like a new way of being invasive is what it sounds like to me. So I, I don't know. <laughs> There's always room for help there. There's always room for help. That's good. All right. And then a stint at Medtronic. Yep. So, uh, yeah, you know, I spent eight years, uh, at Medtronic. It was a phenomenal company, uh, great mission, awesome people and leadership and, uh, had, had an incredible opportunity there. Um, you know, went up the ranks, you know, became VP and I just, that's when I realized like I wanted to do something more. I, I got, sort of got tired of the corporate gig, that lifestyle. And, uh, and I started, that's when I decided to start a marketing agency to, to really help help a lot of leaders that are that are forced to take a look at different ways to represent their companies. And so that's kind of how, how that came about. Got it. You know, I feel like I'm channeling your mom here again. So let's say you got a, a job at, you know, a VP job at Medtronic, which is really like <laughs> a great, a great company and say, I have an idea. Why don't I stop doing that? And I'll take, I'll start a company and it's going to do a podcast and put them out in the market for free and people can listen to them for nothing. What, what, what does the family think about that? Oh man, let me tell you, it was a, it was a conversation with my wife Yeah, and, and, um, <laughs> uh, you know, because she, you know, stopped working three years ago. So, you know, the sole breadwinner, um, I, it wasn't completely, you know, done out of the blue. So yeah. there was a, there's, there was a methodology in the approach and for a lot of folks, you know, in chatting with you, David, I, I hear there's a lot of folks listening to us that are possibly thinking about making the jump. It's hard with the, as they call the golden handcuffs, right? When things are going well, you're getting those nice paychecks, the consistency. Um, if you allow yourself to, to be pulled by a mission, something bigger than yourself. And then you match that inspiration with data. Um, and, and that's what, what, I, what we did, right? So Outcomes Rocket became a, a marketing agency that we started getting clients. And so the data showed us not only people paying us, but the data also showed us that there was huge opportunity. There's companies that range from a million dollars a year to $800 million a year. Marketing agencies solely focus on healthcare. So we saw there's huge potential here. 
uh, after 17 years of working and saving money, we, we were in a position to, to take that risk. And, uh, and last July is when I took the leap of faith. Um, and, and look, it's been, it's been a, a great learning experience, a lot of humbling things. David, I mean, how long have you been running your thing? Yeah, yeah. Since before the dawn of time. I mean, it was uh, I started, actually the last paycheck I got was in 2001. So 2001. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So you're I mean, your jump, right? You were you probably had something reliable and then you went for it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, that was, uh, that's right. I mean, I was working at uh, Boston consulting group, so that was, uh, you know, pretty, pretty cush in a way, but, uh, (laughs) no, the time, the time just came, you know, I said, it's time to go, but I didn't have my own rocket ship, you know, and I do like, by the way, outcomes rocket is a lot, but whatever the hell it's supposed to mean, it it sounds (laughs) a lot better than nuvasive or, uh, you know, striker or something like that. Why, why outcomes rocket? Like, what is that name? Yeah. Thank you. You know, um, outcomes rocket, it's a two part name outcomes is really, it's got two sides to it. Outcomes because we're healthcare, healthcare outcomes. We work with healthcare leaders that are looking to improve healthcare and they need the help to get found and tell their story. Uh, outcomes is also results, you know, without margin, there's no mission. And so we're, we're laser focused on helping our, our clients, our friends, uh, get those results. And the rocket came, was inspired by uh, Google, actually. So this idea of moonshots. Yeah. And, and don't go for 10%. 10% is boring. Like yeah. if you want to inspire somebody, if you want to inspire somebody to invest in you, it, to trust your company, it's about 10x, man. It's about being able to show results that move people's hearts, uh, not just say, okay, you know, like, and so that's what the rocket's about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. So it's not like... Yeah. Outcomes like retro rocket or the little stabilizer rockets that they have once the thing is in orbit. It's actually about blasting off. Blasting and off. and you know why podcasts? I mean, you you sort of talked about getting to know people, but why was that really the way to go? And I think you were engaging in a little bit of revisionist history before. I think my out, I think I was on twenty seventeen. No, not oh, twenty seventeen. I think that's wow. what I that's, that's what I that's what I that's what I'm recalling. But we, we, we can fact check that one uh, in there. <laughs> but you know why podcasts? And uh, I'm interested in if you've had any either notable guests or, or the type of guests that really, you know, really pulls you in. Yeah. So actually the why behind it, you know, my last year of school, I, I, uh, so Miami has a school in Luxembourg. So I did the five-year plan. So I had an extra semester nice. and I, w- I went to, to Luxembourg. It was, and my intention was I, I took a camcorder with me and my intention, I had done some leadership studies my intention was to go around Europe and interview leaders. And I didn't do that. <laughs> I just I just visited countries and I had a blast. So I always had this unfinished business that like I needed to do it. And I remember when I ultimately decided to do Outcomes Rocket, it was part of that unfinished business from my time in Luxembourg. And when I kicked it off, and you know what? It was also a little frustration because I was, you know, I was joining clubs. Like I remember being at the university club in Chicago, like I wanted to meet healthcare people, you know, and I would, I would join different things and you just go and you'd sit at the bar, you'd have a drink. And I just didn't want to like waste time. I didn't want to go have a bunch of drinks just to meet a couple people. And, and so a combination of my desire to build my own uh, network of experts, as well as you know, finish that unfinished business. I, I took off with the podcast and I'll tell you, I haven't looked back since it's been an incredible experience, the best masters and PhD program I've ever, I've ever done. Um, and I've made a lot of really great friendships uh, along the way. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, one of the things I know you, you talk about a lot is the importance of storytelling in healthcare. And I think it comes through and just even in this interview and certainly uh, in your podcasts, but why, why is storytelling something important? Like, why does that apply to healthcare? I mean, I like to tell stories like to my kids or, you know, make up some sort of a story, but like, why, why storytelling in, in, in healthcare? Totally. You know, it is. And thank you for the question, David, like stories allow us to connect with people. They, they allow us to connect with brands. In fact, they allow us to connect with ourselves. If you actually pause for a minute, and you, and you evaluate your personal story, your why. In fact, I actually did this. I I've gone through my theme this year is transformation. Yeah. 
right? It's the, it's my personal theme, but it's also our company's theme. I, I underwent a transformation that, that also included stories within myself that I, 17 years of being a corporate successful person, those stories had to change if I was going to be able to evolve to the next phase of my career, which is being an entrepreneur. Here we are, right? Um, so I'm inspired by somebody like you, David, that did it so long ago. And all of these examples of people, storytelling begins with yourself. And as a leader, you've got to think about your stories and how are you using your personal stories to inspire your team, to inspire your family? But if you, if you zoom into your question about like healthcare, yeah, stories make a difference and they they allow us to inspire others to take action and they allow us to connect. And, and at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's that human fiber that, that really kind of brings us all together before the written word, there was the story. And that is why I love podcasting, David. It, it, like, if you think about, I had actually friend said this, he's like, if you think about it, Saul, uh, Dan Kendall, he's the, uh, health podcast network guy. Yeah. Uh, great friend of mine. Uh, he said this to me, he says, what's the first thing that you hear? Like you hear voice, human voice in, in when you're in your, your, you know, you're an embryo, yeah. you're, you know, you're in the womb. So it, there's no surprise that when you take a look at the competition for attention and a couple seconds on Instagram, a couple seconds on LinkedIn, a couple seconds on email, 14 minutes is the average attention span that you can get with podcasts. So yeah. I'm so passionate about podcasts because it allows you to connect. And the numbers speak for the fact that you can use podcasting to elevate your brand, your top of funnel efforts, and influence buying decisions. Uh, you become an expert. And, and so it's a super powerful thing. It starts with yourself. Then you sort of work out that, that those concentric circles and you, and you begin to influence and help others. Because once you have it down, the best thing you could do is teach your executive team how to tell stories because then it, then the ripple effect happens in the organization and, and, and the results uh, are, are totally worth it. You know, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of wonderful things about storytelling and healthcare and about podcasts. Probably the one downside is that I like to listen to them on like, you know, 1.5 or 2.0. And then I'm talking to somebody, God forbid, it's my wife or a client and say, <laughs> you know, could you please speak at one and a half or two times the normal speed so I can you know, like not get bored <laughs> listening to you. So uh, there's that you have to remember That's to be funny. human. You know, one of the things I think about, you know, where I'm not, I'm no expert like you are, you know, in advertising and, and marketing, but one of the places I think about trying to get that story out to a broad audience is like Super Bowl ads, mm. you know, and I don't normally think for healthcare, I think about like, you know, the Clydesdale horses or whatever, trying to get a story in there. You know, there was at least one ad in the last Super Bowl, I think it was like Power to the Patients ad. We had mm. some celebrity yeah. uh, musicians there. What, what was the point of that? Yeah. You know what? Um, super, by the way, Super Bowl ads, love them, right? Like, uh, just love watching them. We, there's a website with them afterwards. Um, I'll admit I, I didn't even watch the Super Bowl, but the next day <laughs> my son and I, I got a seven year old, we were yeah. at breakfast looking at the ads and just talking about them. Um, and so, uh, the, the power to the patients ad, it was, it was jelly roll, Lainey Wilson, Valerie June first and foremost was about awareness. And, and, you know, reports have shown that awareness of the No Surprises Act is in the high single digits. Mm -hmm. So the motivation there was about helping Americans understand that there is this thing called the No Surprises Act. And, and the intention of the No Surprises Act is to make sure that as a patient, you, you, there's a cap on what you could be billed for out of network services, and it requires insurance companies and providers to negotiate fair payments. And, and, and so a lot of people don't know about this. And, and so that campaign was a grassroots campaign to inform Americans that this is a thing and that it's out there to, to protect us. Let, let's contrast you know, marketing and advertising, storytelling in the healthcare space compared with, let's say, a consumer business. Mm -hmm. You know, is it is it like night and day or are we using the same principles and expect to have the same impact? We always think healthcare is different, but like, 
and I and my I guess my first reaction is like I don't want you know advertising and marketing and healthcare. Maybe that doesn't make sense. I, you know, maybe you know from my phone or computer or you know whatever consumer experience. But like, how does it fit? Yeah, great question, David. There's a lot of fundamentals that are the same. Like you got to get your personas in order. Who are you speaking to? Be crystal clear about who they are, how they live, what they like, what their major pain points are. Some of the best ways you could develop products is understanding your key customer pain points. So whether you're a B2C or a B2B company, if you truly know and you survey and you gut check with data pain points, the you could have the best and most attractive products. And, and it's the same for B2B and B2C. Now the go to market is a little bit different. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example, like three, three days ago, Mark Cuban, right? He, he, they, they interviewed him, uh, and he spoke up on behalf of patients and employers calling out the, you know, three PBMs, the three big PBMs and, and his business cost plus drug co. Uh, so, so yeah, you know, you're right. You know, David, you call out that it's the Mark Cuban cost plus drug co and look power to the patients. Cost plus drug co B two B right like yeah. he he's speaking to employers who are paying a lot yeah that they shouldn't be and and so there is a there is a rise in in uh, in the consumer uh, in the consumer space both consumers but also uh, uh, businesses that that are one of the largest payers for for healthcare that, that there's, there's a need for, for better and for less cost. Um, and so taking cost out of the system is a big thing that he did there, right? Using public relations, right? Let's peel it back using public relations, taking advantage of having a, a session at the white house where he could call attention to a nationally relevant topic that needs addressing and, and, and in doing so create awareness for Mark Cuban Cus Plus Drug Co. so that he could help the and achieve his his mission, right? Which is helping take costs out of the system for a, like like thousands of of employers. Yeah, so going back, I think relating this to the Super Bowl ad, right? So you mentioned that the awareness of the No Surprises Act is you'll say single digits, which doesn't shock me. In the healthcare field, it is a huge deal. And so it's like many, there's like hundreds of billions of dollars at stake. Now, I'm just going to take a wild guess. I, I'm just going to tell you, I never heard of Jelly Roll, uh, Laney Wilson, or Valerie June before that ad and you know, looking up who it was. I'm just going to take a wild guess either. and say, <laughs> I'm just going to take a wild guess and say, they were not in that few percent of people that knew about it ahead of time, right? So they had to associate themselves with this issue. And I think Mark Cuban, you know, he has a reputation for being a hard nosed guy, successful guy. And so it starts with his name, not necessarily because he has a big ego, although he, you know, he may well, but sort of like, that's the brand, right? Just because he said no surprises. I mean, it's sort of, that's sort of, I guess that's a politician way of branding things, but you know, it's this, this third party element of it just makes it so the consumer has a hard time understanding it or having much knowledge about it. I mean, is that the type of like transferal type of a branding where you got to have somebody that's known for something else and they come in and use their brand and their name? So, so it definitely helps David, you know, and so when you take a look at the different levers that you could use to, to, to get to your end goal, whether it's awareness, traffic leads, um, inter influencer marketing is a lever, right? So, so, and, and it's grown, uh, as an industry. So the use of influencers, many, many people like Mark Cuban, who is an influencer, gains from having that influencer status and including it in his brand. Um, influencers are being hired as part of marketing uh, campaigns for, for B2B as well as B2C opportunities. So it, it does play a crucial role. It, it is a lever that could be pulled. Um, so it definitely makes a difference to have names like this uh, at the forefront of a messaging strategy. Now, I want to contrast two things. You know, we hear a lot about the student debt crisis, and that's definitely something like looming over a lot of people. It's kind of a generational issue. There's also kind of a healthcare debt crisis. It's still, despite uh, the Affordable Care Act, you know, that is a leading cause of bankruptcy, healthcare debt. And how do you think about, you know, one relative to the other and kind of activating the consumer element and the political element of 
you know, healthcare debt. I haven't heard about, you know, hear about student debt potentially being canceled. I haven't about, heard about healthcare debt in the same way. Yeah, you know, it, it, we need to talk about it more. And in the US, medical debt burdens, like it's something like 220 billion. Right? Yeah. So it's it's 6% of adults owe more than $1,000 and 1% 1 owe more than $10,000. And when you take a look at, you know, average earnings in this country, that's why they're going bankrupt, right? And disparities exist across all states. You know, there's some like, like DC and Hawaii have the lowest rates. But when you take a look at states like South Dakota, Mississippi, they face some of the highest issues. So it's very real. And, um, and, and that's why, you know, the No Surprises Act was was instilled there it, it's made some progress right uh in fact there's some companies reliant on some of these surprise billings as part of their financial strategy yeah. they're facing setbacks and in in the end patients so right now the big thing that's happening with it it's it's called the independent dispute resolution david so so whenever a payer and a provider can't agree it goes to the idr process and that kind of takes a while on average costing about 700 bucks per dispute. Mm -hmm. So it erodes a lot of profit there. And what happens is patients are still finding themselves caught in the middle of these disputes and getting those bills. So it progress has been made. Uh, and we are taking steps forward on this very big problem of, of medical debt. Um, but there's more work to be done. So it sounds like, you know, it's a big, broad industry you're mentioning, and you weren't satisfied to be in med tech, which is probably like a $100 billion slice of the $4 trillion market. And your agency is, is you know, more focused. It could be big, but it's still not going to probably take on the $4 trillion. Where is the focus? Where are you getting traction, both in terms of, you know, maybe the segment within the healthcare space and size of organization? Like who's, what's your sweet spot? Yeah, no, thanks for the opportunity to share that, David. We... There's two sweet spots for us, two sweet spots. Um, our biggest sweet spot is we really are making a huge impact with software as a service, healthcare focused companies selling to payers and providers. They have, they have a, a tech stack that can make a huge difference in solving a lot of the problems, whether it's taking costs out, decreasing a uh, uh, physician or clinician burnout, uh, you know, there's, there's addressing cybersecurity issues like your company, David, you know, there's, there's a, a huge sweet spot for us there. We're able to help. We identify with them. One of the big things that we pride ourselves on is our innovative approach and, and our, our speed. And so working with a lot of these, these companies that have been funded, that are looking for big impact, we really have, have, uh, have made strides and, and gotten big wins for them. You know, and secondly, it's med tech. Given that I spent 17 yeah. years in that business, I know it well, uh, and we're able to to get some solid wins for for our med tech uh, uh, customers. Sounds good. Well, we'll we'll get put the you know put the SaaS and SaaS and uh, whatever med tech needs uh, <laughs> for it to succeed. So I love those <laughs> love those stories. I want to ask a, a final question, which is sure. about whether, with all of what you're doing, if you have a chance to read any books, anything you would recommend, whether in Greek or English. Uh, as, as you would. Yeah. You know what? I, I love reading. Um, and I read a lot of books. Um, one of the ones that I've been meaning to pick up that I haven't, um, until last month was, uh, beyond positive thinking by Dr. Robert Anthony. I don't know if you have a chance to read that one. No, I just read the cover. I didn't read the book. Should yeah. I read it? <laughs> Listen, the cover didn't get me, but then no. like it was literally like three, four. So talk about bad marketing, right? Like you got to fix your cover, Dr. Robert. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was, it was literally about four or five uh, recommendations later that I'm like, okay. Like, and people that I admire, they said, you got to read it beyond positive thinking is, is, is what it says. So, but you can't capture that. So it's not about positive thinking alone. It's beyond positive thinking. So, so he goes and he, and he lays out, there is right thinking that is data backed and it's like an algorithm. So, so if you have the pieces and you, and you could go through this thought process, this, this, this algorithmic right thinking, you could produce results time over, 
uh, and, and it just, uh, it, it's brilliant. So uh, definitely a, a well-recommended book that I'd uh, share with you and, and the listeners. That sounds good. Well, we'll have to get the author on for a podcast uh, one of these days then. Great. Sure. Well, Saul Marquez, CEO and founder of Outcomes Rocket. Thanks for joining me today on the Health Biz Podcast to talk about storytelling in healthcare. Thank you, David. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.